Hello, everyone. This is Michael McCool, and I am uh, going to be presenting on robotics, the web, uh, and the Internet of Things. And uh, I'm just going to switch from my slides here, but just introduction myself. Principal engineer with Intel. I also was previously a professor at the University of Waterloo in uh, graphics, and then migrated over into HPC and uh, robotics and IoT. And I'm currently one of the co-chairs of the W3C uh, Web of Things uh, working group. Anyways, today I'm going to be talking about this. So here's a introduction to what I want to talk about. So basically, I first want to talk about these three ecosystems. Um, and um, before we can talk about how they can going to converge, we need to talk about what they are. And so I first want to go through some of the technologies that are involved in the uh, web of things, or sorry, in the web and the IoT and in robotics. Talk about different technologies and their commonalities and differences. I'm going to talk about some, some trends we're seeing, um, embedded HPC, AI, compute offload, um, and how these will impact each of these fields and how they're converging. I'm going to talk about um, some, I guess, case studies of some emerging standards that combine some functionality from all these fields. So let's start with the web. Now, it almost seems silly to give a definition of the web because everyone you know, knows what it is. But I thought it's useful to actually, you know, put this up as a comparison to other things. And so, you know, according to Wikipedia, anyways, um, it's a distributed information space with resources identified by URLs. And, you know, we're used to having the web as thinking of as, the, you know, a set of documents that are hyperlinked. And we get them by the Internet and we get browsers. That's how the web started, just a way to distribute hyperlinked documents. But now it's got many, many extensions. Um, and it started with search engines. Um, and then it expanded into uh, web services, which basically took the delivery mechanism for documents and turned it into kind of a way to do APIs, to get our, to, to uh, invoke arbitrary kinds of computations and, and uh, get arbitrary kinds of data. Um, and the other thing that extended the web was delivering applications as content. So when you get a page, it can include executable code, which actually in the browser then extends into this sort of sandboxed uh, execution environment for these applications. And this is actually a pretty major extension because it makes the, the web a kind of distributed operating system. Um, and the other thing that's been happening, I'm talking about briefly, is the semantic web, which is extending the web to uh, include uh, markup for the meaning of uh, information on the web. And this has interesting implications for Internet of Things as well. Let's first talk about some of the technologies that the web, you know, engendered. So first of all is web services. So HTTP basically includes a small number of verbs to get resources, to create resources, to update resources, and so forth. And it turns out that if you use that small set of verbs and you also use URLs and the parameters they can take, you basically can implement um, web services, which have uh, a set of, have an API. If the API satisfies certain properties, then it's possible to replicate those services and scale very gracefully to a large number of simultaneous users. Um, the other thing that's happened is people have uh, wanted to structure their APIs and document them. And so there's been uh, efforts to create uh, markup languages or data structures to represent what an API, uh, or what API can do. Uh, so there's RAML uh, is uh, one example uh, of a RESTful API markup language. And another one is Swagger, which is now, um, it changes name to OpenAPI. And these are metadata formats describing what operations are available on a, uh, on a web service API. Um, in addition, we have uh, cloud services, which um, basically uh, are not necessarily web services, but often do host them. And this gives you access to, for example, machines in the web or databases or so forth. And so you hear all kinds of things of software as a service or platform as a service or a network as a service, software-defined um, networks, software-defined uh, uh, architectures and so forth. Um, and this is, of course, combined with the idea that you can also send parts of your application down the wire to the browser. 
And so really a web application consists of both parts in the browser in the client context and parts in the server. And it may also, of course, involve uh, uh, application pieces from other servers on the internet. So, so one of the technologies in enabling this are microservices and containers. So microservices is sort of an observation that you can build large applications or large services by composing smaller services. And so there's been an effort to kind of uh, decompose large complicated uh, services into, into smaller more manual pieces that can be composed. Um, and these are microservices. And the advantage of this is you get the same benefits uh, from a microservice that you got from a service. You can scale them up, you can replicate them, um, and, and you can get uh, a better availability redundancy by that approach. Containers um, are a way to help deploy services. And there's really a couple of things that containers provide. One thing is they do is they encapsulate the various um, dependencies that a particular record service needs. Um, and they also, in some cases, provide enhanced security around an application. This is not true for all uh, container mechanisms, but if you use a virtual machine around your uh, container, around your microservice, then you can get enhanced security. Um, and there's been a lot of effort on creating lightweight containers that also provide good security and encapsulation. Um, so anyways, uh, that's very interesting. And the other thing that has happened with the web service infrastructure is uh, the availability of standardized mechanisms for structured data. And there's two main mechanisms today, JSON and XML. Um, and XML uh, sort of arose out of SGML, as did HTML, but it's a way to create recursively structured uh, tagged data. Um, and JSON uh, rose similarly, but out of the uh, JSON object format, although it's not necessarily bound to JSON, that did bound to JavaScript. Um, but both of these provide the ability to create and distribute structured data that can be easily parsed. Now, two other things have happened with these structured data. First of all, there's been an effort to create compact binary representations. Uh, for JSON, that's CBOR, and for XML, it's X, X, S, EXI, sorry. Um, the other thing that's happened is metadata to describe the structure of the, uh, of the data. So rather than just being free form, you now can provide uh, structure of the data in terms of schemas, um, and you can use it to validate whether or not the data is well formed. Um, this is also important metadata for uh, designing and, and testing if code is correct. So uh, we have now uh, standard binary mechanisms to transfer data, data uh, reasonably standard ways to describe the structure of the data, reasonably standard ways to describe the structure of APIs, and uh, nice ways to containerize and deploy at scale these applications. That's the web has given us. These are all very, very useful things. Uh, the other thing the web has been working on is uh, a definition of meaning. So the web 3.0 um, was envisioned by the W3C to extend to cover meaning. Now, originally HTML tried to capture this by having semantic tags, but the trouble was that was a closed system. It wasn't, a, wasn't, a, wasn't an easy way to extend uh, what tags could mean. So in the semantic web, what you can do is you can create ontologies or systems of representations. So you can say what things uh, uh, refer to what other things and what they mean. And this is actually used uh, relatively broadly um, in things like Facebook and Google to do markup for search. Um, in addition to just marking up web pages, there's a general mechanism called RDF for describing uh, uh, what are called databases of triples. Um, so I'll show you more in a minute. There's also mechanisms to reason about those, uh, those relationships and to derive new relationships using a set of rules. So there's a whole set of technologies around this. And you may also hear the word ontology. Ontology is basically a vocabulary for some semantic uh, markup. 
Um, and this turns out to be very interesting technology for applying to the Internet of Things, as I'll discuss later. Uh, but just a bit more background, makes more concrete for RDF in particular. So basically, RDF describes semantics as a large collection or a collection of triples. Every triple has three parts, subject, predicate, object. You can think of them that way, or subject, verb, object. Um, and so, for example, Socrates is a man. That would be a triple. And man is a mortal would be another triple. And so these triples relate objects with relationships. And so you can have a large graph, a uh, directed graph, described uh, with these collections of RDF statements. Um, RDF, RDF statements are stored in a distributed fashion. So basically it's called a federated database. And so the idea of the semantic web is you have many different um, sets of triples and then merge them uh, by drawing from different stores on the internet. Um, it's also possible to represent any relational database as a set of triples. Now, the other thing that's interesting is the idea of standard ontologies. So in order to define you know, certain standard relationships, you might refer to an external standardized ontology. So for example, RDF itself includes standard uh, relationships for type of and subclass of and belongs to and so forth. And so you can use these standardized markup markups to uh, give yourself uh, meaning for relationships between objects you define. Um, Al defines a set of markups that then enable uh, reasoning engines to make inference inferences. So for example, it might know that is a is transitive. So is is transitive. And so then, because it has a triple Socrates is a man and men are mortal, it actually knows that Socrates is mortal. And it can infer that relationship, even though it's not explicitly given in the database. And this is basically how semantics can be encoded and how you can fill in the blanks uh, in, uh, in a database. So that's what RDF is. So those technologies are all given to us by the web. What about the Internet of Things? Well, if you think about a definition, you know, you think about, you know, a large number of devices. And the idea of the Internet of Things, that these are sort of regular objects that, you know, exist around us in the world. Um, and they also have, you know, their own sensors and actuators. So they can sense and they can affect the environment. Um, I'll talk later on about the requirement for actuation. Um, in the IoT, it's not necessarily the case that a device can both sense and actuate. Very often, we just have plain sensors. Um, uh, and this is a distinction actually from robotics later on. Um, Internet of Things uh, enables numerous applications. Uh, one of the confusing aspects of the Internet of Things is the fact there's many different uh, spaces in which it can apply, and those spaces have different requirements. So the requirements of the home for, for example, for privacy and security and setup uh, complexity and so forth are different than that in the industrial use case. In the industrial use case, you may not care as much about, for example, uh, privacy, but you may care a lot more about safety um, because you're controlling much bigger machines and the uh, danger is higher. Likewise, in a vehicle, you may have to satisfy different sets of requirements. In medical, you have a different set of requirements. So IoT is quite diverse because of the different kinds of spaces which can be used. Now, the IoT is not just the devices at the, at the endpoint. It's also all the infrastructure that connects those devices to the rest of the system, including the web. And so really, the IoT is not you know, one device. It's really this, this network of devices. Um, and the, this network is characterized actually by diversity. So edge devices and endpoint devices can be very small, can be very low power. Um, and the, in the infrastructure themselves, the gateways may have you know, medium amounts of compute. And they may connect into the cloud, provide backend services that may have a significant amount of compute. In addition to diversity and compute, be diversity in communication, maybe a variety of kinds of communication. Uh, besides the obvious Wi-Fi and uh, internet, you'll also have things like Bluetooth and LTE um, and Zigbee and so forth. 
And these have different uh, characteristics. They may not be reliable. Uh, they may um, uh, have different aspects of uh, security. So one of the issues of some of the more lightweight communications uh, uh, infrastructure is that they can't necessarily carry large payloads and that makes security actually more difficult. Um, the other ecosystem I'm not gonna talk about, talk about much in this uh, talk is actually mobile devices, phones and tablets. Uh, those actually are actually very useful in the IoT, especially in the home context for user interface devices. So very often the phone is an, is an integral part of an IoT service in a home environment. That's where the user interface lives. And I won't talk about that uh, except to the extent that it acts as an extension of uh, the web often. And that often the actual functionality is provided in a web service and the human interface could be as simple as a web page. Now, talking about robo robotics, Robotics are, robots are very similar to IoT systems, but the, the difference is really that robots really must have the capability to affect their environment. In other words, a robot that can only sense doesn't make any sense, right? It has to be able to actuate, it has to be able to move something or change its environment, even if it's moving itself. Um, and, uh, but conversely, uh, by definition, a robot doesn't need to have a connection to the internet. It's not really part of the definition. So a robot is actually, you know, con conceptually is an autonomous system. Um, it can act on its own, it can make its own decisions. Uh, while this is a useful, you know, definition, as we'll talk about later on, part of the convergence, we talk about, you know, communication of robots, uh, that leads to a lot of more opportunities. Now, ideally a robot, is autonomous, it has autonomous perception, it can sense its environment, it can plan and make its own decisions, it can move from place to place, it can reach out and manipulate its environment somehow, um, and it can also communicate with people. Now, not all robots will have all these features, and in particular, industrial robots uh, may only have manipulation and that's it. They may not even have sensing. And so uh, we're moving now towards more advanced robotics that actually do have these uh, capabilities to have autonomous behavior. And uh, now in the industrial space, traditional industrial robots aren't necessarily autonomous, but the co-robots that work with people definitely have to be because they have to be able to obviously the human community, human robot communication, they also have to perceive their environment for safety reason. Now, our, a robot can be a very complicated system. And this is an example of a typical robot stack, software stack. And so you'll, you'll see there's like a loop here of sensing, planning, and acting. And so robot needs to perceive its environment, which may have a, a number of different senses. Um, and it's not just the sensors that give the raw data, it's also all the processing that goes on to make sense of that data to recognize objects, to recognize words, to track faces, to track people, uh, to create a map of the environment, and so forth. And it may also have to derive information from that, those perceptions, such as a knowledge of where it is in space, localization. Um, once it has an idea of the environment, has an idea of where it is, with respect to that environment, it may have some goals. And the applications may have certain goals, uh, like deliver a pizza from one place to another. And so using knowledge of the environment and information from the senses and what its goal is, it will do a plan um, and uh, to achieve its goal and it will carry out the behavior. And so that plan may have very, you know, several different steps. It will have to deal with the plans being upset. You know, if you're trying to move from place to place and you had an obstacle you hadn't seen before, you'll have to replan to go around it and so forth. So relatively complicated uh, system. Now, uh, actually one more thing I wanna mention here is you notice the cloud offload and control up here. So that's actually um, not necessary, but is an interesting fallback plan if all the computation you need doesn't exist in the robot. And this is where web services and IoT sort of connect with robotics is when we do the, the cloud offload. There are other ways to connect with IoT, for example, 
uh, connecting the sensors, they're not on the robot. We'll talk about that later on. Now, there's also different kinds of robots. So one large category is mobile robots. So a mobile robot, um, basically, um, its main function is to move from place to place. So an autonomous car, a delivery robot, and so forth. And so it has to do various things. It has to be able to sense its environment. You be able to figure out where it is. You be able to plan a path. It needs to move along that path while avoiding obstacles. Um, actually, this is a very fundamental issue with mobile robots is safety, is you definitely don't want to run into people. Um, and so um, that's one of the major uh, you know, safety factors of a mobile robot is it has to be pretty much guaranteed not to hurt anybody. Uh, and that, of course, can be very difficult. Um, in fact, generally speaking, functional safety is one of the stricter requirements for robotics. Um, in addition, it may have to have a, a user interface uh, to interact with a person. And that might simply be a web application, might be a web page, but it might also be verbal commands or gestural commands. Uh, social robotics is the other extreme, and a social robot uh, doesn't really necessarily even have mobility or manipulation, but its prime purpose is to interact with people. And so it may have speech recognition and face recognition. It may understand people's body pose. Um, it may have enhanced perception to recognize objects, for example. It may do dialogue and conversation, basically chatbot type uh, things. It may even recognize emotions. Um, and it may even recognize social relationships. So it knows, for example, when it can interrupt a conversation. So um, now, of course, you know, you might combine these two things. Um, and so you might have mobile robots with more or less social capabilities. Um, and uh, of course, uh, in there's another whole class of robots, which is manipulatory robots that I haven't talked about, which is be able to pick up things. And so you can imagine, for example, a scenario um, with a, a personal care robot that might help around the house by picking up things. Maybe you're bedridden and you need something to pick things up for you. That kind of robot, of course, would also need additional capabilities to sense objects uh, and plan how to pick them up and put them away and so forth. All right, so that's robots. Um, now, how do robots and the IoT connect? Well, um, as I said before, one of the differentiators of robots is they pretty much must have an actuator. Um, they're not just passive sensors. It's okay for an IoT system to be a passive sensor. It's not okay for a robot. Now, if a robot has an internet connect connection, and it pretty much you know, will, um, then it can participate in an IoT ecosystem. And that allows various things that can happen. It can share experiences. So very often, robots use machine learning. And so you might have a network of autonomous vehicles that all share data about the kinds of situations they run into, and they can all learn from each other. Um, they might use sensor data from other IoT devices. So for example, to localize my robot, I may use cameras in the room looking at the robot as opposed to the robot looking at the room. And that's totally fine. And I would communicate the data to the robot over the network. I might offload work to an external system. For example, to recognize faces of people, I may consult a database or even a face recognition service that lives in the cloud. Um, obviously, training data is very important, and a lot of machine learning systems depend very crucially on large amounts of training data. And of course, if you have multiple robots um, that are, for example, uh, cooperating on a task, such as cleaning or uh, security patrols, they will have to coordinate. Um, and so you may have mo a swarm of robots uh, coordinated over the internet. So these next generation connected robots are you know, explicitly leveraging IoT capabilities. Um, now, they also have to be autonomous. Now, IoT devices uh, really should be semi-autonomous too. Uh, nothing is worse than an IoT device that just doesn't work when the network is down. Um, and so you need some autonomous functionality. But robots, by and large, are primarily autonomous, um, and the, the cloud really should be a backup. In particular, there are a lot of things that everyone needs to do that are real time and uh, need to be taken, taken into account immediately. So for example, the obstacle avoidance mechanism in a, in a mobile robot needs to be local because it cannot depend on cloud connectivity for safety. 
So you really need to have local processing uh, for that kind of situation. And there's a lot of real-time constraint, constraints in robotics. A good, good example actually is this robot right here, which is balancing on two wheels. That requires a real-time feedback loop on the robot. There's no way you can offload that to the cloud. In fact, you need a specialized real-time operating system in order to do it. So if we look at the differential requirements of these systems, uh, you know, we see that, you know, the web, we, we uh, are interested in being connected. We're interested in scaling up to a large number of users. Um, in the IoT, we also care about scalability and connectivity. We also often care about large numbers of small devices, uh, low cost, almost disposable devices, uh, low power, they might even go on battery, might only be occasionally connected. Um, we also care about safety. That depends on the application, but certainly in industrial applications, we care about safety. In robots, in addition to functional safety, uh, we have a lot of local processing to do, so we need high performance. We may also need real time. Um, now, real time may also show up in IoT, um, as may high performance, but these are kind of the primary characteristics. And certainly all these platforms need to be reliable, need to be available, we need flexible programming, and we need to have security. All right, so now I'm just gonna talk about uh, some emerging trends and technologies and then go into some case studies of some different standards. So obviously we're seeing a lot of artificial intelligence and uh, basically machine learning and perception. And what's interesting about this is that it leverages the large amount of data that's already available on the web. So the way you train a neural network to recognize cats is you show it millions of images of cats, and those are easily available on the web. Uh, one connection here to IoT is the IoT provides even more data. And so uh, the IoT will be very, very useful for artificial intelligence because it gives these machine learning systems access to more real world data. Now, in addition to sort of this perceptual computing, is also semantic processing. And so the semantic web I mentioned earlier uh, makes more explicit um, some reasoning rules and information about meaning of the data, uh, which could potentially also be useful. In particular, uh, tagged images, for example, um, could be used to help a learning algorithm to understand. Uh, for example, recognize certain people because they've been tagged in certain images. Uh, another trend is seeing more compute at the edge. So the Internet of Things uh, has sort of trended for very, very small, very cheap devices. But actually, when you look at robotics, you see a need for actually significant computation at the edge. So you need to have uh, perception and computer vision happening on the edge. In fact, the compute power required in some like autonomous vehicle has been estimated at about 10 teraflops. So that's a lot of compute uh, in an IoT device. Um, and when you, you can see other applications as well, for example, smart signs that recognize uh, faces or people, uh, speech interfaces. Now, a lot of that right now ends up being centralized in the cloud service, but there are many cases where I have speech interface on the device itself. An additional mobile robot needs to do uh, mapping and localization, and this can actually involve a lot of compute. Now, distributed computing is the other trend. So we have been, sort of been trending towards centralized compute with cloud services. But there's actually a trend now to migrate data uh, and compute back to the edge. And something's called fog computing or edge computing. The idea that you can distribute your computing throughout the network it doesn't have to be all be in one place. And even with cloud computing, the actual compute can be distributed across many servers. There's also the idea that the service is what matters, not the computer. So what you care about is you want to access a service to do something. You don't really care where it is. As long as the service has is responsive and it satisfies for throughput and reliability and so forth. Um, the other thing um, is real-time systems. So a lot of IoT devices and certainly robotics devices are safety critical. And so they need to respond for sure when something happens. And that needs to have uh, a, some guarantees for response time. Likewise, control systems like balancing need uh, real-time uh, capabilities. 
In fact, uh, real time also comes into play in something as simple as media control, uh, video playback, and, and audio processing. Um, and so there's already been some efforts on uh, doing some real time capabilities there, but robotics requires even more. So I'm not going to talk about four things um, that kind of integrate robotics and web and IoT. And this is sort of, um, these three technologies are kind of a slow uh, collision. And, um, and, uh, and so we're, we're, we're going to see more and more of this over time. So I'm going to talk about a few points where I see some trends. And uh, someone just asked me about the slides. I just want to mention that the slides will be available after the talk. And uh, I will uh, I'll make a link available uh, through, through the site. Um, I also should mention that these slides include a number of hyperlinks uh, to resources uh, that talk about all these things. Um, anyways, I'll talk about four case studies. Um, uh, Ross, uh, OCF, uh, the W3C row of things I've been involved in, and OpenFog. And I have summaries here, and the thing that's especially interesting to me about all these things is that basically microservices show up in all of them. Now, I'm interpreting microservices quite loosely uh, as being, you know, a distributed set of, um, of services that communicate over the network and that are loosely coupled by, by network APIs. They don't necessarily need to be web APIs. They could just be uh, their own custom protocols or sockets or co-app. Um, but the, the fundamental idea is loosely coupled services. You don't care where they run. You don't care what computer they're on. You don't care what language they're written in. All you care about, you can talk to them over the network uh, with a standardized API. So let's talk about ROS first. So ROS is the robot operating system, and it's um, produced uh, or, or uh, I guess sponsored by the Open Source Robotics Foundation. And basically, uh, it's, uh, it's actually a middleware stack. It runs on top of Linux, usually Ubuntu, although other Linuxes are possible. And it supports um, uh, a graph communicating nodes. Now, primarily, uh, ROS uses a publish subscribe mechanism uh, for communication. In, in fact, it uses what are called named topics. So one node publishes information on a certain topic, another node listens to it or subscribes to that topic, and then it's notified when new information is available. And this gives loose coupling between the various nodes in the graph. It also supports uh, request response, like in a web service, where you, you ask for something, wait, and then get a response later. Um, both are both are fine. So um, now ROS has got a huge community. Um, it's very popular, and also in addition to the basic runtime system for ROS, there's many tools, including this uh, visualizer you see here called Arviz, and also simulators like uh, Gazebo. Um, this, in fact, is a graph for ROS to do autonomous navigation. So if you want a robot that can autonomously navigate, basically generate a map um, and then figure out where it is and then generate a path through that map to go from one place to the other, this is what the graph would look like. And uh, this is all open source software, and it's something you can, uh, you can get and install on a relatively small robot. So now this is not as sophisticated as the autonomous car needs to be, um, in particular, you know, it's not necessarily going to be very smart about following the rules of the road. But this uh, shows you that, uh, you know, the basic functionality for um, autonomous navigation is, in fact, uh, available in ROS. Um, and I, I mentioned already RViz, and uh, this sort of shows you, um, you know, what RViz looks like. You know, you can see uh, what the robot is, its internal representations of the environment. You can see its sensor data. Um, and uh, and so forth. Now, Arviz and Ross um, works in kind of its own ecosystem, and so it's useful to bridge this to the web. And so there's another project called Robot Web Tools, which basically takes the uh, Ross node-to-node -node communications, which are in their own protocol, uh, Ross TCP or Ross UDP, 
and it converts them to JSON that is then sent over WebSocket. And then there's a JavaScript library that can be loaded into a browser or in another JS that can then digest um, those messages sent over the WebSocket. And so you can now create web services that can talk to ROS. You can take create browser applications that can talk to ROS. And so a good example is uh, ROS Web, which basically lets you build a custom control system for a robot uh, inside a browser. And once you've got data in the browser, then you can do various things like visualize information with WebGL or with D3S. I'm sorry, uh, uh, you can use Google Maps to coordinate your localization data. Uh, you can use web security, you know, secure web sockets, for example, to manage uh, and secure your information. And uh, basically all the stuff that the web gives you. So while Node, uh, ROS nodes themselves are not web services, um, this, uh, this tool, ROS Bridge, basically converts a robot into a web service. Um, now, ROS by itself actually has a, a number of uh, problems that make it hard to use um, in a distributed architecture. Um, and so there's, or sorry, in a, in a commercial architecture, let's say. It was originally designed as a research architecture. So there's been a lot of work uh, on uh, doing the second generation of ROS, ROS2, and they wanted to resolve a number of things. Um, one of the main things was real-time support. Uh, ROS by itself is designed to run on Linux, and it, it wasn't very reliable in a real-time context. It didn't have any guarantees for uh, latency or execution time. So they wanted to add real-time support. Uh, part of this was adding uh, quality of service control and communications the trade-off between reliability and latency in communications. And so you able to control that. Um, there's also a lot of trouble in ROS. You need a, a master node in ROS. If that node fails, your entire system fails. And so they wanted more distributed uh, node management so that if one node fails, it could recover. Um, and there's various other technical things that were needed here. So for ROS2, rather than building their own middleware stack, they decided to adopt an existing middleware stack. And interestingly, they picked uh, OMG's Data Distribution Service, our DDS. And this is actually designed for industrial IoT. So in other words, a robot internally is an industrial, uh, under ROS2, would in fact be an industrial IoT system. Now, someone just asked about propagation delay. Uh, I mentioned that ROS is a distributed system and uses communication between nodes. And then we went real time. And you're probably wondering, well, that won't work as a real time. Well, actually, there's now uh, a new standard for time uh, for latency sensitive networks. Basically, there's a new standard for, uh, for, internet, for the ethernet that can guarantee delivery within a certain time frame. basically by pre-allocating part of the bandwidth for latency sensitive messages. And so yes, you actually can get real-time systems uh, that work uh, over ROS. So I have lots I want to talk about. So I want to talk about more about DDS, could take a whole talk on its own. But in fact, ROS doesn't use a whole lot of DDS. It actually uses just the real-time publish subscribe subsystem and then layers its own abstraction layer on top of that to make ROS2 relatively independent of, uh, from DDS. Um, I do want to talk about a few things. Um, I have, uh, this is a plug for a little open source project that I'm distributing, which is basically open source hardware kit. Um, if you go to this uh, GitHub site, uh, SAWR on GitHub, uh, you will find a open source project, uh, open source hardware and software for building a robot that can do autonomous navigation. And basically I'm planning to experiment with a lot of these technologies and push out um, interesting uh, use cases and tests on this platform. And uh, this is actually based on, um, originally it was based on the uh, Intel RealSense Robotic Development Kit, which has an upboard and the R200 camera shown there. But there's also a version of this uh, that uses the Jewel and the ZR300 camera. Now there's another kit out there, um, uh, the TurtleBot 3, which was just announced last week at uh, uh, IRCA, SERA. 
And uh, this is actually a, uh, a modular uh, robotics kit, uh, similar capabilities to the, to the Sauer. Uh, and it's uh, done with a collaboration with Robotis and uh, 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 actually Intel and uh, OSRF. Um, and so it basically includes uh, the basic sensors and capabilities you need to do uh, a lot of interesting things, including uh, uh, person tracking, uh, gesture recognition, face recognition, object recognition, uh, autonomous navigation, mapping, and so forth. Um, in addition, this particular robot has a real-time subsystem of an MCU, so you can use it to do, for example, uh, balancing. Uh, not with this configuration, but if you reconfigure the panels, you can create a balancing robot. Um, now, uh, the real sense also adds perceptual capabilities, and this is an example actually of embedded HPC. Um, so uh, you might, for example, in a robot, want to know uh, to track certain objects. Uh, you might want to uh, identify people. You might want to look at the, the body pose of people. Uh, and so actually the, uh, the RealSense SDK, uh, and then the Linux version is actually uh, uh, open sourced, um, lets you do that. And so for example, you can track objects in the environment in real time. And this actually runs, uh, and it's actually interesting, surprisingly fast. So on the Jewel, I can do SLAM and object tracking and person tracking, um, all basically uh, on a single Jewel using two out of the four cores only. So, so actually, um, it's, it's quite performant and quite practical in, a, in an embedded system. Um, it would not be practical over the web because the latency would kill you. Uh, going round trip to the web uh, would be much higher latency than doing processing locally. In uh, addition to identifying objects, you may also want to identify people. In particular, for social interaction, you might want to uh, track people's faces, uh, do facial recognition, uh, identify their expressions, and so forth, identify their gaze direction. Um, these are all very important social cues for a social robot. Um, so that's, that's Ross. And I think just to, to recap, there's many moving parts in a robot's uh, software stack. It's actually, uh, ROS itself is basically a distributed system based on basically communicating nodes that are loosely coupled in a pub sub architecture with named topics. Um, some of those services can include things like this, uh, object recognition and facial recognition, uh, which can actually be significantly compute intensive. But that's okay because um, you can easily add more compute to a robot by adding even more processors because it is distributed. So the microservices architecture is, is quite a viable way to structure something because you can easily scale up the compute on a robot. And if it won't fit in the robot, you can always go to the network, go off the robot, and perhaps use a nearby processor or even the cloud if you had to for some of this compute, as long as you can handle the latency. Now I'm going to talk about another um, example, which is the Open Connectivity Foundation. And uh, this is actually directly targeting IoT, not robotics. Uh, but I want to talk about some of the similarities between the two of these things, between ROS and, uh, and OCF. So OCF is primarily based actually on CoAP, which is out of IETF, um, although it is also extending to other uh, things like HTTP. And CoAP is basically a simplification of web services for smaller devices. Um, but in addition to sort of building on CoAP, um, OCF also provides uh, models of standard IoT devices. Um, it, uh, it sponsors this project to build an open source implementation. Um, it provides certification services so that, you know, once you have built a device, you want to ship it, you can get it tested to see that it satisfies the standard, including the security aspects of the standard. Um, and so OCF provides a kind of coordinating mechanism. The associated project, IOTivity, is an open source implementation of OCF. Um, and uh, now OCF is actually targeting multiple verticals, but the initial release, I would say, is primarily focused on consumer IoT. Um, and what's interesting is the core framework includes many data models. The data models are actually modeled using RAML which were originally designed for web APIs, and that will be our repurposed 
to apply to uh, IoT devices. And this gives you, you know, an idea of, uh, you know, um, the kinds of resources. So basically a device in OCF has a collection of resources for various things. Some of these resources uh, actually refer to physical sensors. Others might be services and others may just be generic resources describing the device, meta information. And to give you an example, um, actually I'll show you this, here's a light bulb. And it may include, you know, various information about, you know, you can turn it on and off. I can set the dimming, dimming state. But I can also find out information about the light. And I also can find out its, its, its current state. Now, generally speaking, um, uh, the uh, interaction model for uh, CoAP and for OCF uses five verbs. Now, four of these verbs are also available to HTTP. Uh, create, retrieve, update, and delete. Those are those verbs are also available off HTTP-based web services. But the additional verb that's available in CoAP is notify, meaning a device can send an event um, when something happens, and it can notify um, uh, the uh, the client asynchronously. And this is actually extremely important for IoT devices because IoT devices need to be able to sleep; they can't always be awake to uh, give responses. And so notification allows uh, uh, a, a client to be, to be told when something happens rather than asking constantly has, if something has changed. Now, I'm not going to go into depth here, but I think I just want to mention this one thing. This is how the data models look like for OCF. There's really two parts. One is the RAML, which describes the APIs they use to talk to an OCF device, so each of the verbs and what they mean and which resource. And then the JSON schema, because when you, when you ask for information from an OCF device, the information comes back as JSON, actually a CBOR, but uh, conceptually JSON. And so the JSON schema describes the structure of that data. So here we see, again, uh, an OCF device is kind of like a miniature web service. Um, and you model as a web service, and you can talk about the data structures on it as a web service. Now, if you're interested um, in looking at this more depth, there's an example um, called the Smart Home Demo, which basically takes IOTivity, and it lets you um, set up a demo. And what's interesting is that you can run it as a simulation completely inside a set of Docker containers. So if you go here, you can set it up and run it on a single laptop, just by starting uh, three different Docker containers. Um, and one of those represents a home gateway. One of them represents a cloud service and one is a, a, a sensor node. And uh, these all can communicate um, by basically web services. So, so basically in summary, um, you can kind of see that OCF devices are like microservices. Um, they're communicating over, over the network using web-like protocols. Um, we can describe them as if they were web services, although not exactly because of Notify. Um, and, uh, and they also you know, um, uh, can use uh, technologies like Docker containers. So in fact, the home gateway may actually run several different um, OCF services, for example, uh, separated by containers. Now, However, I mentioned already that RAML is not perfect for describing uh, IoT web services because it doesn't necessarily have the right semantics because a web, a web service isn't exactly the right thing, same as an IoT service. And so I'm involved in a working group under the W3C to come up with a metadata format for describing IoT services and things as a thing description. And one of the things we're doing is we're trying to connect this into uh, semantic web into uh, talking about ontologies for for uh, for the web uh, for for the for the world actually um, using semantic web technologies and the the holy grail is to be able to describe things so well that you can automatically convert between them so there's a number of different standards on the web uh, on the IoT right now and interoperability is a big problem. So one of the holy grails is to get semantic interoperability. We should be able to plug together two devices that use different standards 
And if we can describe them well enough, we should be able to automatically convert between them. Uh, currently, we are very far from being able to do that. Um, but that is the, the hope while he was working in this area. <clears throat> now, the final um, thing I want to talk about is open fog. So I talked about edge computing and how there's kind of a need for being able to offload work. So right now, I could set up my own offload node to offload work. So if I had a robot and I went to offload work, I can I could set up a local server of my own and offload work to it under my own uh, service. But what if I just wanted to rent space on the cloud like I do with Amazon today? Um, how would that work for uh, local distributed computation? And so OpenFog is basically looking at a way to build a distributed uh, cloud service, basically, so that you can distribute work not only over servers that are far away in a data center, but over devices that are nearby. But provide similar uh, mechanisms for manageability and accounting and security and so forth, but in a distributed environment. So that your gateway in your house or maybe your television set or whatever can basically be part of that fog. And the idea is the fog is a cloud that's close to the ground. Now, fog computing actually spans the cloud to uh, edge devices. So it's the entire system. It's not just um, uh, the gateways. But the idea is that you can offload work from devices that may be battery powered to devices that can have a lot more power and a lot more compute. And that way you can minimize the amount of compute uh, you have to put in individual devices. But there's a lot of work to do here, especially around security, if you want to have multiple tenants from different third parties sharing hardware. That is actually very challenging to do in a secure fashion. And that's one of the challenges that OpenFog is facing. Um, but, you know, the uh, one of the mechanisms to do this is to, you know, take the work that's been done in cloud services for managing web services, web services, uh, containers, uh, virtualization, and so forth, and to use that to create strong encapsulation around tenanted um, uh, services. So um, just to wrap up, um, so it's my opinion that the requirements of these three ecosystems are different enough that they're not really going to merge. Um, you don't really need you know, functional safety in a web service. Um, and but you do need it in robotics and in some IoT applications. Um, so you're probably not going to get a completely shared technology base. But there are many core components um, that can be shared. So structured data representations, microservices, containers, um, security mechanisms. These are all things that everyone needs. Um, and there's no reason to duplicate those things. So I really think that, for example, Ross is taking the right approach by looking at using a, a middleware stack like DDS uh, rather than building their own. And I think we'll see more of that. Um, and the W3C Web of Things group is seeing how much they can reuse from the web stack in the IoT space, in particular, semantic technologies. Um, and also, when you think about the IoT, in fact, um, you really have to have all these things working together. Many IoT services depend crucially on web services in the cloud to function. I think in the future, also many robotic services, uh, for example, deliveries, um, uh, will also need web services to manage them. Um, and so we need to see all these things interoperating. So there's many uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, right now, FOG is uh, in, pro in, in progress. Um, there's a lot of work to do, um, and uh, the Open Fog uh, uh, standard is uh, just one uh, uh, case of that. Um, but we're looking at moving microservices to fog computing. Um, you might say, why don't we use OpenStack or something? The trouble is OpenStack ha is a little bit too specialized for the cloud environment. And so we need something that has uh, more capability for migration, can more gracefully deal with uh, uh, services failing and so forth. And so uh, fog computing is different from cloud computing, uh, but we're seeing, uh, I, think a lot of, I think we'll see a lot of progress on fog computing in the next few years. Um, 
I think we're going to see more use of web technologies and infrastructure and IoT and robotics. Uh, we already see that with the adoption of CoAP by OCF. Um, we're, we're seeing things like containerization um, being useful uh, in, uh, in FOG. Uh, in robotics, we're seeing adoption of existing IoT middleware stacks. There's no reason to reproduce things. I also think that semantic interoperability is uh, something that uh, has a lot of potential in both IoT and robotics. And finally, for software development, um, these are very uh, difficult systems to build. Uh, I think one approach I could see is a more data-centric approach. So rather than worrying about the computation and the language being used to program the algorithms, uh, you should focus more on the APIs and the data and how that data is structured and on visualizing the flows of data. Um, and then worrying about um, using technologies to, uh, to containerize uh, those applications. Uh, two other big challenges, though, beyond that is uh, security and safety. Um, the trouble with both security and safety is they're all or nothing uh, behaviors. You know, one hole in your boat will sink your ship when it comes to security. And something similar is, is true also for safety. And so those both require some very strict uh, software engineering, um, uh, engineer, software engineering, basically, and uh, it's, uh, it's not easy. So I think one of the challenges there is going to figure out how to isolate um, those systems so the extra engineering involved for safety and security um, can, be, can be minimized. Um, this is especially important on the safety side in the case of autonomous vehicles which have strict regulatory requirements around safety. Anyways, that's uh, my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I am going to uh, see if I can get these slides made available, and I imagine I'll be able to make them uh, distributed on the same place you can find the video for this after the talk. Take care. Mm -hmm.